Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 270th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where three days a week we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Raising farm animals in your backyard is not just rewarding, it's actually easier than you think, especially if you have Kari Spencer to help you get prepared. Just text CHICKENS to 33444 or visit BackyardAnimals.com to receive our free webinar on how to grow chickens, goats, and more, promote biodiversity, and put your backyard animals to work. On today's podcast, we have someone who is educating and empowering others in the food revolution. We're talking to Colin McCrate about high-yield vegetable gardening. Colin has been growing food organically for the past 15 years. He worked on a variety of small farms in the Midwest before moving to the West Coast in 2003 to teach garden-based environmental education. He quickly realized that Washington is the most beautiful state in the Union and has been farming, teaching, and designing landscapes there ever since. He founded the Seattle Urban Farm Company in January of 2007 and still looks forward to planting potatoes every spring. Colin is the author of two books, High Yield Vegetable Gardenings, from our friends at Story Publishing, and Food Grown Right in Your Backyard. Welcome to the show today, Colin. Hey, thanks for having me. You bet. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Sure. I got interested in sustainable agriculture when I was in college. Mm -hmm. I think I'd always been focused on environmental issues. Like that's what was meaningful to me, but I had a hard time figuring out how to apply that in the world. And when I started gardening, which kind of just happened arbitrarily, I guess, just made sense to me. I understand that. Yeah. And it was just a really great experience. You know, I started growing food and it was engaging and interesting because I'd always been interested in botany and it gave me an outlet for that and a way to do it productively. And then I started meeting like farmers in the area Mm -hmm. and and they were just all really inspiring people. Mm. So I was like, you know, I, I looked up to them, I suppose. So I wanted to be like them. And so I just started working, you know, once I graduated, working on different small farms around the country, just trying to learn because I, I didn't really know anything at that point. But I was so interested in it. I felt like I was learning pretty quickly. So I just kept doing it. And eventually I did end up in moving out to Washington and I was just trying to figure out a, something I could do. And I guess I was intimidated to buy farmland. That seemed like a big stretch and it was scary. So the idea was just, can I find a way to live in Seattle and still grow food for a living? And we kind of just adapted and tried to figure out what it was people wanted and how to make that happen. And, you know, here we are 10 years later. Wow. Are you using other people's land? Yeah. So our business is set up more like a landscaping business than what you might think of as like an urban farm where we're not selling vegetables at market. We're going into designing garden spaces for people. And then if they want, we actually help them manage it. So it's really similar to a landscaping business where we do design, then we can actually build a garden space, and then we can actually come back and help make sure it stays beautiful and productive for people. Got it. So did you go through some schooling on how to do this, or is this something you just read books on and watched YouTube videos about? Mostly, I did not go to school for landscape design, so it was kind of all field learning. I mean, all of my farming experience and landscape experiences just come from being outside and being in the field doing it every day. Best teacher right there, I'll tell you. Yeah, I always felt like experiential learning was the only thing that really worked for me. I enjoyed going to school, but it was just, you know, obviously so abstract. But once I started doing things, it all started to click into place. Yeah, well, the first time I was in college was 1981. I got a 0.5 grade average my first and only semester because it was too abstract for me. At that time, I was running my own business. I used to clean service and build fish ponds here in Phoenix back then. And, you know, I was doing what I wanted to do. And so being in school wasn't quite for me. Fast forward 19 years, I'm back at ASU, different story. But then I was really clear about what I wanted to learn. 
Yeah, I think that makes a big difference. I mean, being young and being in college is hard for some people. I was one of those people. I graduated, but I never felt like I got everything out of it that I, I would get if I was in school right now. That's for sure. Cool. So the Seattle Urban Farm Company, that's a structure that you work under, and you're basically landscaping other people's yards for food. Mm -hmm. And are you actually farming people's spaces and growing food to sell to others? No, we're not. So all of our projects, the food is consumed on site. We do a range of projects. So we have residential projects. Someone, a homeowner might call us and say, you know, I just moved into this house and I want to redo the entire landscape and make it really productive, kind of an edible landscape is what we would call it. And so we go in, we design it with them. There's raised beds, there's fruit trees, there's blueberries, raspberries. Maybe they have a chicken coop. There's a patio and an outdoor kitchen. And we help them set all that up. And then we can come back and help just keep everything in check because there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. Other things we do, we work with restaurants. So some of our clients will actually build them more of like a production garden on their roof. And we'll go up there and just plant the crops that they want, maintain it. And then the chefs actually come up and harvest it, prepare it and serve it in the restaurant. Beautiful. And then another type of client we work with, like apartment buildings and condo associations. So we can have like community gardens at these apartment buildings, but instead of being just a free for all or people have their own little garden bed, they actually have us come and manage it as a collective space. And then the residents can actually harvest from it and just take whatever they want. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. How cool is that? Plus you have your own podcast. That's true. We do. Tell me about that. Well, it's called Encyclopedia Botanica and it comes out once a week and it's really like a, a how-to podcast. So each week's a different topic. You know, we talk how to cultivate the soil or, you know, a certain crop we pick and say, this is how you grow it. This is what you should look for when it's ready to harvest, pests and diseases it might have. And we're just coming up with a new topic every week and trying to just put the word out there. Yeah. And Hillary, your wife runs that, right? That's correct. And she's also a photographer? Yeah. So here's what I think we ought to do. I think we ought to have her come back on the show and tell us all about the podcast, because that's not what we're here to talk about today. But I definitely wanted to get a plug in for it. What's the website for your podcast? Well, you can get to it just through our normal website, which is seattleurbanfarmco.com. But you should also be able to find it on iTunes, iTunes Stitcher, or yeah. any of those things. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. So what we're here to talk about today is your newest book. And I have a copy of it sitting here on the desk in front of me. It's called High Yield Vegetable Gardening. Grow more of what you want in the space you have. Tell me about this book. It looks like an absolutely spectacular book. I love, you know, the interactability of it. Tell me about it. Yeah, well, Seattle Urban Farm Company, I started with a really good friend of mine. His name's Brad Holm. And we both came from backgrounds working on farms before we started the Urban Farm Company. And so this premise is, you know, what techniques and systems would you use if you were running a small, diverse vegetable farm? And is there a way to adapt those systems to work in a like a home scale? So a lot of it's about intentionality and planning and efficiency, because as you can imagine, if your livelihood depends on the amount of food you can pull out of a certain amount of land, you're going to be pretty thoughtful about everything you're doing and you're going to keep track of it so you can get better every year. And so it's my theory that if people are more thoughtful and organized and intentional in the way they garden at their home, they could double or triple the amount of food that they pull out of their garden without expanding the garden at all. Yeah. Well, and you're a big proponent of record keeping and keeping a diary. Why is that? Well, I think that that's just a really good way to learn. So tracking the dates that you plant your crops, the dates that you, that you harvest the crops, you know, ideally weighing the harvest and actually figuring out how much you're getting, because you can then just like go back and look, as an example, this year, we grow sugar snap peas every year in the garden. And, and they're actually, they're doing moderately well this year, kind of mediocre, but we're able to go back and look and be like, are we crazy or are we getting like half as many peas as we did last year? And we can go look at it and be like, oh, well, actually, we're getting a lot less. Maybe there is an issue. Like, well, let's try to figure out what that issue is. And then we can adapt what we're doing. So having records allows you to like, you know, rather than just relying on your memory, did I like that variety or was it like not as good as I thought it was? You can actually say, OK, 
I planted these two types of zucchini. This one produced twice as much and it tasted way better. So like, I'm never going to order the seed for this one again, because I think a lot of gardeners, it's just sort of like you get into habits and you're sort of like, well, I, I kind of like these things and I'm just going to plant things I'm used to planting, but you're not really, I guess, as engaged in the, the improvement of it. And that's not for everybody. It's not like everybody needs to be a high yield vegetable garden. Like some people probably just want to go out there and spend time in their garden and they don't really care how much food they get out of it. But then if there are people like me or the people that hopefully will buy and read this book, it's more like, let's see what we can do here. Like get more food out of it. Let's get better quality food, get varieties that really do well in my region, varieties that taste really good to me and, and basically just get better at doing it every year. People garden their whole lives and you're always getting better but i think record keeping speeds that process up so maybe you know instead of getting to a place after 10 years maybe you can get to the same place in three years because you've been really intentional about everything that you're doing well i know we ran into this problem here at the urban farm this year and just for clarity to you the urban farm is in north central phoenix we're in the middle of the fifth largest city in the country it's a third of an acre and I've been growing food here on the property for 28 years. Cool. And we ran into this problem this year. We planted the tomatoes a month late. Mm. And last year, we had an absolute bumper crop of tomatoes. And the way that the weather happened this year, we got a couple of cold spells down into the 70s in May that slowed the tomatoes way down. And we've basically gotten nothing. And last week, it was 119 degrees here in our yard. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So keeping track of when you plant things is so incredibly important. Because if I would have looked at a, a book, a diary of when we planted tomatoes last year, I know that it was early on. You know, we planted them in February. And for Phoenix, February is about the right time. You know, so really, really important. It is really important. There's lots of things that when you go back and look at your records, surprise you. Even like it's only been a year, but you're like, oh, man, I did that. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> so it's just really great. I actually do it all online, like in spreadsheets. I love spreadsheets. <laughs> and I didn't used to like spreadsheets. When I started growing, I was pretty artsy about it, I guess. And really disorganized. And I honestly, when I was younger, it was just sort of, I want it to be disorganized. Like this is a, an experience I'm having and I don't want to be super diligent about everything. But then I just found like I, I was making the same mistakes over and over again. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So then once I started keeping track, and this also comes a lot from learning from other growers that I was kind of interning under, I was like, oh man, this is crazy. Like you can just learn so much more quickly and then I got really addicted to spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'll tell you what, if you are going to seriously grow food and seriously grow food for production, for selling at a farmer's market, for chefs or anything like that, for really something other than just, you know, growing some food for your family, record keeping, forward planning, make sure that you hit the planting dates. These are all important things mm -hmm. in high yield gardening, is it not? Without a doubt, all of those things. I mean, I think there's a lot of ideas in this book, but to me, the backbone of it is record keeping and planning and everything else kind of like ties into that concept. So that's really the premise of it. So I'm looking at the front cover. It's a beautiful book, by the way, and I love the lay flat. It's a spiral bound, so it lays flat. It's great on a potting bench. Oh my gosh, do you have laminated versions of this? <laughs> we should. We definitely should. Yeah. If you take it outside in the garden, which is what you're supposed to do, it'll get dirty and it'll probably get water stained, but that adds character. One thing I should mention, there are a lot of charts that you can fill out in the book. And I think it's a cool to do that in the book. But when you buy the book, you get access to downloadable sheets as well. So there's a bunch of copies that you can get electronically, and then you can either just use the exact format that we have, make copies of it and just update it and make a new one for yourself every year, or you can print them out and do it on paper if you like to do that in a notebook, or you can even like put them into your Excel program or whatever and, and change and modify them to make it exactly how you want it to be. But we put that on there because I thought that was really important that a kind of a hurdle for people is just getting a system set up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. We tried to lay it out as, as clearly as how we like to do it. 
Right. You know, I love books coming out these days that come with PDFs and web links so that you can actually, you know, for your planting dates page on page 56 of your book, you have last frost date, first frost date, which is specific to where you live. And then it has all of the things that you'd like to grow, annual herbs and vegetables and basil. What is your planting date for basil? And you can actually write it in here. This is a really nice book for that. I like that. Yeah, thanks. So I'm looking at the front cover, and there are four main points that are listed on the front cover. They are manage your soil for deep fertility, plant and plan exact quantities of your favorites, always plant your favorite stuff, use succession and relay planting for continued harvests, and choose the right varieties for maximum production. Talk to me about these. Let's start at the bottom. Let's talk about deep fertility of soil. What are you talking about? Um, well, I think that, and this is something that a lot of experienced growers will know, but you really have to start with caring for your soil. And that means adding nutrients to it each year. As you know, as being someone who's grown in a place for 28 years, if you add amendments to your garden and then you try to grow in it for five years, you're going to just deplete all of those nutrients, obviously. So, you know, we have a whole chapter in here about soil management and taking soil tests and understanding the implications of those soil tests. So we go into it pretty deep, just sort of, you know, here's how you would read your results from your soil test and how to apply the amendments, when to apply them, what they're going to do for your crops. It's really just being thoughtful, like you can't add compost this year and then decide it's going to be okay to not add it for the next two or three years because it was a hassle and you don't want to deal with it again. <laughs> um, you have to check your pH every year and see if it needs to be adjusted. In particular, compost, and I think in organic gardening and farming is really paramount to everything else. But we would recommend adding it to the soil like every single season. Every year. Well, so here's what I know about. I don't know about Seattle, but I know about Phoenix. And what I know is that if you add a nice layer of even two inches of compost on top of your gardens every year, by the time the year's done, the heat and the plants have eaten it up and it's pretty much gone. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what's nice. You know, if you have raised beds, you would think if you're adding soil to it every year, you're just gonna have a big mound on top of it. It's gonna be spilling over. Exactly. But that's not the case. Right. Um, there's always room to add. Like you said, two inches is probably a perfect amount for most places. You're always gonna have room to add that on top of your beds. Yeah, perfect. So plan and plant exact quantities of your favorite. You know, this is a funny question that people ask me. What should I plant? Yeah. It, <laughs> you know, we talk about this a fair amount in the book and we give examples actually to try to inspire people to think about what their needs are, because every gardener's needs are different. Is your goal to have a salad every single night with dinner, or is your goal to have a year's supply of garlic that you can store and eat every night? Or, you know, and maybe you have both of those goals, but not everybody's goals are going to be the same. Maybe your goal is just grow tons of tomatoes because you like to can them and you make pasta three times a week. And so like really being thoughtful about that and the implications of that, because if you do want to plant 20 tomato plants in your garden, you're probably not going to have room for some other crops. So you really have to prioritize and be thoughtful about what you want ahead of time. Like an example I like to give, you know, relates to say cilantro, because I actually think cilantro is a challenging crop for a lot of people. It is. And if you love cilantro like I do, and you want it just always to be available, you really don't need very much at any one time. Right. But the thing about cilantro is it grows really quickly and it does not last very long in the garden. Right, so exactly. It bolts and you can't stop it from bolting, right? Like you can't just grow cilantro and say, just hang out there. I want to harvest off of you for the next three months. Right. Because it's really just going to last for a week and you have to harvest it. That'll laugh at exactly. you. <laughs> exactly. And so what I would do in that situation and what I do in my own garden is I seed it once a week, you know, or every other week. And but I only seed maybe six inches at a time. It's not really helpful if you go out in the spring, you say, I love cilantro. I'm going to plant this entire row of my bed in cilantro because then you're going to have a week or two where you have way more than you could ever possibly use. Most of it's going to bolt and you're going to have to pull it out. But if you're planning, and this is kind of the exact quantities, if you say, okay, I'm just going to be organized about this. I'm going to put it on my calendar that every Monday I'm going to go and seed 
cilantro in my garden. What, six seeds? Well, yeah, maybe like six or 12 seeds. And you're just going to leave that, you know, maybe you're going to put every new six inch section next to each other. And eventually it's going to fill up that row. By the time you're at the end of the row, you've removed the stuff from the top of the row and can put a new crop in there. And you've never wasted space and you've never wasted tons of cilantro. And that's the sort of thing you can do if you're organized. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's succession planting, correct? That's correct. So you plant it every two weeks. So for here in the desert, we plant our winter greens starting in September. And so if we planted on September 1st, probably a little hot on September 1st, but it's just an example. If we planted six different greens on September 1st and then on September 15th and then on October 1st and then on October 15th, it's going to spread out that harvest over several months rather than getting it all at once. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly obviously how you're doing it when you're selling for market or you have a farm. You have to be able to bring salad greens to the market every Saturday. So that basically means you have to be planting so you have new stuff available. And there's no reason not to do that in your home garden. Because, yeah, then you're just stretching out this harvest, you know, for four or five months. Yeah. So that's succession planting. What is relay planting? Well, relay planting is just a variation on that. The idea would be you have a crop in the garden and you're planting another crop next to it before the first crop is harvested, but maybe when it's almost harvested. So as an example, you may plant spring carrots. And when those carrots are halfway grown or three quarters of the way grown, you may decide you're going to put in some broccoli because you want the broccoli to fill out that space for the second half of the season. And there's space between the rows of carrots to put in little tiny broccoli transplants without disturbing the carrots. And then you can harvest the carrots when they're mature, you know, a couple weeks or a month later and open up that space before the broccoli has like filled out and crowded them and shaded them out. So it's almost like just like a slightly more intricate version of succession planting. Beautiful, beautiful. And then the last thing on there was maximum production. Choose the right varieties for maximum production. Yeah, and this is honestly one of my favorite ideas because I like, I think like everyone who's a grower, it's really fun to think about varieties. And everybody loves to have seed catalogs and pick things out. But, you know, the challenge is there's dozens and dozens and dozens of varieties of every crop. And it's really hard to tell just by reading descriptions, maybe which one is perfect for your situation. So I think it's really helpful to just think ahead of time, like, what am I working with? And so in a place like Phoenix, although I've never grown there, if you want to, I'm assuming, extend your salad green harvest, you have to pick varieties of lettuce that can tolerate some heat. Absolutely. Right? Because like lettuce just in general hates heat. It gets really bitter and it bolts. And there's some varieties that have been bred to tolerate it better than others. But you have to know that. And then you have to experiment with those varieties and pick the ones that really work well in your climate and in your microclimate. And similarly, you know, you may live in a place like here in, in Seattle, we have terrible powdery mildew and it shows up every year. And so there are varieties of squash that have been bred to be powdery mildew resistant. You know, they still get it, but they don't get it as bad and they don't get it as soon. And so you have to make this trade off. Maybe this variety of winter squash, the fruit a little bit smaller, or it's not the heirloom variety that you know, I read about that I really want to grow, but it is powdery mildew resistant. So I'm going to choose it because it's going to be more successful in my garden and I'm going to get more food out of it. And so you have to make those compromises. I just think going through all the different reasons you would select a crop, because some crops you're going to select, you're going to say, I'm growing tomatoes, but for me, it's not about volume. It's about flavor, right? Like I want the best beefsteak tomatoes ever. And if they're bland or mealy, it doesn't matter if I have 50 pounds of them because I don't want to deal with them. Like, I really just want a perfect tomato on my sandwich. So you're going to pick a different variety than, you know, somebody who's saying, all I'm going to do is make tons of tomato sauce. So just give me a bunch of Roma tomatoes that are really productive. And I'll, I'll add spices to my tomato sauce and make it taste good. Those are very different needs and yeah. And so there's infinite ways, I guess, to choose varieties and get what you want out of the garden. So I'm on page six of your book now. 
And it says at the top, the basic tenets of high yield gardening. Just cover those for us briefly, would you? Yeah, sure. Select the best site and use it efficiently. And this is something, again, it'll change, I suppose, on where you live in terms of what's the perfect site for a garden. But in Seattle, more sun is always better. You know, people have a hard time finding a space in their yard that gets enough sun for a garden. But you have to prioritize a garden. If you want it to be successful, you have to make it a priority and give it the space it wants. You can't say, well, I need to have a patio here and this is where, you know, I'm going to put a soccer goal. So the garden has to be over here behind this big tree. If you want the garden to be productive, you have to give it the space that it needs. Well, interestingly here in Phoenix, the less sun, the better, especially this time of year. Yeah. So that's just sort of being conscientious of like, where does the garden need to be to be successful? Not where do you need the garden to be? And then as we've talked a bit about plan well and keep good records, which I think I've covered, but maybe my favorite part, know your plants. And I think this is something that all gardeners probably appreciate. You know, one of the things that makes gardening interested is that every species behaves differently. And so I think taking the time to just understand the differences between your crops will make you a lot more successful. And also just make it so you're not pulling your hair out all the time. Because as an example for us, like bok choy, it's a brassica, but it doesn't behave the same way that kohlrabi does. And maybe they grow in about the same amount of time, but bok choy is a lot more likely to bolt. It's a lot more sensitive to environmental conditions. And kohlrabi is like, you don't have to do anything. You just put it in the ground and it grows and it's done. And just appreciating that and not expecting crops to do something that a different crop does. So that's kind of all that's there. But I think it's important because, I mean, one, it makes it a lot more interesting. You can go out and look at a plant and be like, this is what the plant should be doing right now. And this is what it is doing. So therefore, either that's awesome and I don't have to, and like I'm happy or there's a problem and I should do something about it. Select the best crops. So this is kind of what we were just talking about. You know, pick the stuff that works best for you. And honestly, this is something that I think is important. Is it in a way when you're record keeping and you have your own garden, you're the best source of information for your own garden because even within a city, there are microclimates. And so you may have different conditions, like your tomatoes may ripen sooner or later than your friend who lives on the other side of town. So you might have to actually do things differently, which is why, again, like record keeping is really important, is that you can get more and more kind of into the fine details of what happens in your yard at your garden. I love this next one, grow with a purpose. Yeah, grow for a purpose. So this comes back to kind of like what I was saying about cilantro and deciding that that's a priority. And so I'm going to do my garden planning. And this is just me talking personally so that I have cilantro all summer long. And I think everyone will have a different purpose for their garden. And it might be, you know, all I really want to do is have a lot of vegetables during the summer when my family's home and we're cooking dinner every night. And I'm going to put the garden down in the winter and not really worry about what happens out of there. But for someone else, it might be, I want to see how long I can stretch the growing season. And it's really important to be getting greens out of it nine months out of the year, 10 months out of the year, and keep trying to stretch that. So setting a goal for yourself and knowing how you want to use your garden. Really, really, really important. So on this page, the basic tenets of high yield gardening, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven more things that you can go check out. <laughs> yeah, we'll be here all day if I go through all of them. <laughs> no, it's, you're good. You're good. I want to give people a reason to go out and get this amazing book. It's called High Yield Vegetable Gardening, Grow More of What You Want in the Space You Have by Colin McCrate. And this is published by our friends over at Story Publishing. So I want to touch real quickly on your first book for beginners, Food Grown Right, comma, in your backyard. Tell us, give us two minutes on that. Okay, so Food Grown Right in Your Backyard is a gardening book for beginners. It starts out talking about a lot about site selection, how to pick a location for the garden, and then how to build the garden. You know, different ways of constructing raised beds, preparing the soil for the first time, setting up a drip irrigation system. And then the second half of the book is really what um, they're called crop profiles. So we kind of just describe the most popular vegetable crops, each in about two pages. And there's photos, and so it says, you know, 
this is about how many days to maturity. This is the soil temperature it likes to germinate at. Here's some pests and diseases that affect this crop specifically. Here's when you know how to har like when to harvest it, what it should look like when it's ready to harvest, which is actually something that beginning gardeners struggle with. They're like, I'm looking at this plant and I don't know if it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So the great thing about Food Grown Right is there's hundreds of photos in it. And I think that it just makes it really easy to get a, a lot of the points across and just get people started gardening and, and understanding the process. And then hopefully, you know, eventually they graduate to high yield vegetable gardening. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you might have learned from it. Well, I failed many times. <laughs> uh, well, I have a couple ideas, but here's one that I think is relevant. Because as a gardener, I feel like you're constantly failing on some level, if you think about it that way. And so crop failure is something that happens to everybody all the time. Yeah, I'm in the midst of one right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think what's, you know, really important is that here we have tons of problems actually with brassicas. We have root maggots and cutworms, lots of caterpillars. And so every spring we have to replant broccoli and cauliflower over and over again. And not all of them, but we know we have gardens all over town and you'll go and you'll plant a half a dozen perfect broccoli plants and you'll go back a week later and four of them will just be completely dead. And I think that it's really common for gardeners to, when they have a crop fail, to give up on it or to say, okay, I planted broccoli and it died, whatever, now I'm gonna plant tomatoes. But the reality is, you just re have to replant it. You're kind of constantly running into these mini failures, but you have to just see those as part of the process. And I think getting to that state of mind, for me anyways, was a huge insight years ago, just like, oh, this is just how it goes. Like, I'm always gonna, every time I go into the garden, there's going to be a problem that I have to solve. So what do you consider your biggest success? Well, honestly, I'm probably most proud of just starting this business and creating jobs for people that are also interested in growing food. It's not always easy to want to be a, a farmer and be able to go out there and get a job and be able to actually do it. So it's been really cool to just create positions for people and then watch them really enjoy the work that they're doing. Yeah. So what drives you? I think that I'm still pretty inspired just by the day-to-day -day experience of doing food production. Over my career, I guess I've just seen it positively affect so many people's lives. You know, it's like really satisfying when someone calls us and they've never gardened before, but they really want to and they're kind of intimidated by it and we help them get a garden set up. And then you see them a couple months later and they're just gushing with stories about how excited <laughs> they are to like harvest. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And so just to see that happening in people's lives is, I mean, it's pretty inspiring. It makes you want to keep going. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? You know, a book I really like, it's called Great Possessions by David Klein. Hmm. Yeah. And he's an Amish farmer in Ohio and he's an author. Great Possessions. It's kind of a cool book. It's like excerpts from his journal. Oh. Yeah. And it's really cool. And it's honestly not about here's what we planted today and here's what the buckwheat is doing. It's really more of an observational journal about like living on a farm and appreciating the beauty of it and the seasonality of it. So I just find it really inspiring. It makes me say, you know, like I wish I had the perspective of David Klein today because I think he could see the beauty in this. Absolutely. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Boy, <laughs> final piece of advice. Well, I should be able to nail this. I, I'm sure I've probably already used up all my good advice. <laughs> There's always one more. Well, here's the thing. I, actually, honestly, it ties into what I was just saying. And this is in the intro to high yield vegetable gardening. But I think that as a grower, the only way to be successful is to maintain a real love for it. Mm -hmm. And so I think just keeping that in mind, I, you know, I've run into a lot of gardeners who just like to complain about the pest problem that they're currently having. Right. And I just feel like that's really detrimental to you becoming a better gardener, to be honest. For me, like seeing even like the beauty 
in the challenges of like working with nature outside and like trying to get crops to grow and all the obstacles you have to overcome. It's like a really beautiful thing because it can, in a way, fighting against nature, but at the same time, it's a really intimate relationship with nature. Yeah. And we were working with nature. Yeah. And if you can appreciate that, then I think it's something that you can do for your entire life. That is the case. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Colin. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Hey, how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, the best way is to go to our website. Our website is seattleurbanfarmco.com. And we have a contact form there. And you can check out our work. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Perfect. And then you can find High Yield Vegetable Gardening, Grow More of what you want in the space that you have by Colin McCrate and Brad Holm. I'm sure it's available in all the great places around. And you can find show notes from today's podcast, including a link to this book at urbanfarm.org forward slash Seattle Urban Farm. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Raising farm animals in your backyard is not just rewarding. It's actually easier than you think especially if you have Kari Spencer to help you get prepared. Just text CHICKENS to 33444 or visit BackyardAnimals.com to receive our free webinar on how to grow chickens, goats, and more, promote biodiversity, and put your backyard animals to work. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen three days a week for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.